So, can you tell me a bit about yourself and your role within this program? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Steve Colburn. I'm a material scientist. Um, I was educated at UCLA, and um, I uh, work in Camarillo, just a few blocks from where uh, Dr. Lear works. And um, uh, after we met, um, uh, we decided to have a collaboration on uh, analyzing these objects more thoroughly. Um, a lot of the objects that he'd removed had not been analyzed um, adequately, so. Um, uh, I have uh, done a lot of uh, microscopy and um, elemental analysis on these objects and uh, come up with some interesting findings. Um, one thing we found out is that um, the devices are definitely nanotechnological, uh, <laughs> nanotechnological devices. Um, they're not just simply uh, metallic objects that somehow got into the body. Um, they contain carbon nanotube electronics and carbon nanotubes are the field I'm working in in my, my regular job. Um, and uh, they give off radio signals um, and um, they have uh, odd nanostructures in them made of carbon nanotubes. Uh, carbon nanotube electronics are a hot topic in material science today, uh, by the way, and there's many amazing properties about them. The aliens have apparently perfected the technology to use carbon nanotubes in these devices. And um, uh, there are proprioceptor nerves that, that um, go into these, uh, the tissue capsule or a gray uh, membrane around these devices. And um, well, one, of the, one of the most fascinating findings was that, um, that these devices contain, uh, many of them contain meteoric iron uh, from the, uh, judging from the trace element pattern of um, gallium, germanium, uh, uh, precious metals like iridium and platinum. And iridium is not found on Earth in any great amounts. And, um, uh, we did the isotopic analysis of uh, various elements from the metallic cores of several of these devices and found out that um, they uh, were made from off-planet material, um, extraterrestrial material. Um, there's a certain pattern of isotopes uh, for each element on Earth, and if, if that pattern is, uh, is varying by more than a percent or so, then it's um, uh, a um, the conclusion can be drawn that, it came, that the material came from off-planet. Um, and uh, some of the isotopic ratios and the elements in these um, devices are extremely skewed compared to uh, quite unlike um, uh, the uh, isotopic uh, ratios of elements on Earth. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Kuntz, our colleague uh, who's also involved in the research, um, concluded that uh, they probably came from um, somewhere else in the galaxy. Uh, they don't even seem to be from our solar system. Uh, these um, devices have uh, carbon nanotube networks inside the metal, um, so um, they're obviously manufactured devices and they seem to be uh, well beyond uh, the technology for, of civilian science at this point. So it's not possible that this something like the nanotubes could have been made through nature? It has to be manufactured? No, they were discovered in 1991 um, in uh, Western science. The Russians discovered them perhaps 10 years before that, um, but uh, they're not known to be found in nature. Um, and uh, certainly not in, uh, in meteorites. Um, so there's no way that it could be faked, really? No, I don't think so. I, it, it, some people have argued that these devices could be made by black government projects, but I, I think that the fact that they contain extraterrestrial material argues strongly against that. So what you're saying that this is, it was discovered in 1991, right, the, the nano, the nanotubes? Yeah, many of these objects and date, they come date, from, date from well before the discovery of carbon nanotubes in, uh, in science on Earth. Um, these um, people were reported uh, that these objects were put in, you know, like 30, 40 years before a lot of times. So, so when you say nanotubes, do you mean that these, these things could be used to store information, perhaps? Um, yeah, they they can be made into uh, electronic networks. Um, carbon nanotubes are um, they're um, like uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Graphite is um, a hexagonal array of carbon atoms, and the, these arrays, these layers, are stacked. If you take one of these layers, one of these hex hexagonal arrays of carbon atoms, and roll it up into a tube, that's a carbon nanotube. And uh, there's um, various types of carbon nanotubes with different. Um, numbers of walls and single wall are the most uh, studied right now and these, these contain single wall carbon nanotubes. Single wall carbon nanotubes are um, often less than a nanometer in diameter. These are small diameter single wall carbon nanotubes that are in these devices and they, those can be used as electronics because there are uh, metallic and semiconducting single wall carbon nanotubes. So you're saying this is very tightly stacked and if you took out all the, if you laid it end to end, it would definitely be a lot larger than it would. So all this information is tightly stored together? 
compacted? Yeah, I, I would think so, yeah. The, the total length of the carbon nanotubes in one of these things might be several miles. Of, uh, I haven't figured it out, but wow. it's got to be a lot. So the technology used to compact that much information so tightly seems to be pretty futuristic. Definitely. I don't understand how the, uh, the metal could actually be put around the carbon nanotubes uh, without uh, destroying the nanotubes because the, the melting point of these metals is like 1500 degrees Celsius and um, if you poured molten metal over the carbon nanotubes it would just destroy them or uh, convert them to metal carbides. So would it be possible to say that the information required to make one of these carbon nanotubes isn't readily available on Earth? It must well, have come from somewhere make, else? We can make carbon nanotubes, but to make a um, 3D intricate composite like this with carbon nanotube electronics inside the metal, that's well beyond our technology at this point. Physio we've speculated that there, they might be physiological monitoring devices or listening devices. Um, they're definitely relaying information about the subject uh, to uh, the aliens um, through um, radio signals. They're not always transmitting, so... Um, have you noticed actual radio signals emitting oh yeah. from it? We've detected radio signals coming from them, and uh, in two of my reports we outlined some of the frequencies that they give off. Uh, the last two devices we uh, detected radio signals from. Are they common radio signals that are found on Earth? Uh, some of them are uh, aeronautical and satellite communication frequencies, uh, but um, the, there's also a very high frequency microwave uh, uh, discharges as well. So could it be possibly dangerous to have a lot of microwaves emitting from inside a person? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a lot of microwaves. We've only detected perhaps milliwatt levels of power, um, but um, it's hard to say. I, there's been no uh, ill effects noted from uh, anybody having these uh, devices inside them. What about after the surgery? Has In fact, they, don't, uh, they don't have um, any rejection or uh, immune response by the body. So that you, it's possible to not even notice these tiny things in your body? Yeah, most people don't notice them at all. Um, so would, would it be fair to say that on an X-ray? Would it be fair to say that there might be a lot of those in a lot of different type of people? Oh, that's very safe to say. Wow. Some of the frequencies that we've been able to gain some knowledge of from uh, from classified information is that they are deep space fixed fixed or mobile deep space frequencies. And that presents quite a conundrum because. Um, what advanced civilization would be using a radio wave to begin with. So do you think it would be possible that the government could know about these nanotube technologies? I think they know about them. I don't think they can reproduce it as yet. But, um, it's anybody's guess how much technology the Black Project community has. Some of, the, some of their stuff is reverse engineered alien technology reportedly. So would it be possible to take this apart and perhaps learn the secrets of what's inside it and perhaps use it for our own? Technology. That's what we'd like to do at some point. We'd like to uh, take one of these devices and um, uh, do um, mount it, um, mount it vertically on um, a scanning electron microscope uh, mount, and um, take um, an elemental map of one layer of the object, then etch away a layer with um, uh, a beam of fast atoms, and then uh, and do the next layer and get a three-dimensional structure of the object that way. How strong is the object? Is it easy to break? Uh, this one, I don't know. I haven't tried to cut it yet. Um, most of them are fairly easy to break. I've, I've cut, um, I've cut uh, four so far, and three of them are fairly easy to break. One was immensely strong and could not be cut at all. With even diamond tools, wouldn't scratch it. It appeared to be some kind of highly advanced uh, iron metal matrix composite with, with carbon nanotubes. You mentioned there was a sort of biological capsule that surrounded it. Would right. that be used to protect it, to prevent it breakage? No, I don't think it's to protect it. I think it's to um, organize the uh, neural input to the device somehow. Is that we, if we were able to uh, back engineer some of the, uh, the technology that we have in these devices, we could prevent, for example, inflammatory processes and rejection. In other words, if we could make something similar, you could wrap a heart, a kidney, a screw, a pin, or whatever, and instill it into the human body, and the person would not have to take any anti-rejection medication for the rest of their life. So, and this was Tell me about your abduction. I have had, my family, it runs in my family. My brother has had experiences. His family, um, since the marriage, has had experiences. Uh, my hu husband underwent experiences, as did I, from being married into my family. <laughs> it seems like that was the protocol for marrying into the family. And um, 
because I had had unusual experiences from the time I was really, really small, and my brother, too, from the time he was an infant. And I believe they started with my mom and dad because uh, my dad had had some sightings. I had had a sighting. My mother had a sighting of a UFO over our home. Um, it was it ran in the family, and uh, there were a lot of experiences that my husband and I had in um, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. And he would actually get night terrors, which we thought were from. Um, he was a Vietnam veteran, had experiences in Vietnam, and thought it was post-traumatic stress syndrome. It turns out it wasn't from Vietnam. He actually then started remembering in the early 90s that the night terrors he was experiencing was from these creatures being in our home and taking us at night. What was your reaction when you realized you had been abducted by extraterrestrials? Let's see, it was removed in 1996, probably about six months to a year sooner before that. I realized um, I had a scoop mark on my leg. And I did not know there was an implant in there. I had no idea. I just saw this scar on my leg and um, on my left calf. And uh, when Roger was, uh, we had, I was assistant section director and then section director of MUFON for Ventura, Santa Barbara counties. And Roger was helping me and he had arranged to do surgeries and uh, he had gotten funding through Bigelow, and um, for three surgeries, we had we had three people that were going to have supposed implants removed. Roger had gone through the X-ray process and exam process. Well, one of them was Whitley Strieber. He had an object in his ear, and he was to be one of our guest speakers, and then go ahead and have a surgery. Last minute, he decided against having the object removed from his ear. And it's on the outside of his ear. He still has it today. Um, it's under the skin on the back of the ear. And uh, he decided against it. Well, we had funding for three surgeries. And Roger was, uh, Dr. Lear was beside himself as to, you know, what was he going to do? And I said, well, you can remove this scar off my leg, this, whatever it is. I don't know how I got it, but make that the third surgery. And uh, he he said, that's fine. He says, but we have to go through the examination process. We'll need to get x-rays, blood tests, which we did. And on the x-ray, um, surprising both to myself and him, he saw an object on the x-ray that was just under the scar, the scoop mark I had. And that's how we discovered that there was actually an object under the scoop mark. What was your reaction to the news that aliens had implanted a device in you? I was shocked that there was anything under that scoop mark to begin with. I, I didn't know how I obtained that mark, but it was an unusual mark and it appeared, seemed to just appear, at least I just noticed it. Um, I think he was shocked because he, that was the first time he had ever had a scoop mark with an object under it. So he was shocked, I was shocked, and I kept trying to, um, you know, rationalize that, oh, Maybe I just got something in my leg, and after it was, you know, extracted and um, examined, it was nothing. I kept saying, are you sure this wouldn't be found in, in a regular body? You know, is there any way? And he goes, no, 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 Alice. This would not be found in your leg. It could not, you know, it would not be uh, there naturally by any means wasn't a calcification or anything like that it had a lot of unusual um, characteristics and he's since then done some more um, uh, surgeries that have had uh, the same type of object is there anything else you want to add well I think he's he's you know he's doing something that is so important and he helped so many people, and he never asked for anything, you know, in return from anybody that he he uh, tries to help. Um, he's just, you know, he's he's doing it because he has the not only the ability to do it, but he has the need to find out what is really going on, the curiosity as to what's going on. It's affected him.
everything he does, his life, his career. Um, he's very dedicated to trying to find out, you know, what these objects are. And also, with these objects, we're finding that they have uh, no inflammatory um, response around the object. Could this possibly, could this technology help uh, the medical profession now in dealing with transplants where, you know, these people with transplants have to be on horrific medications for many, many years where, you know, if this technology could be developed where um, there would be no rejection. I mean, it would be wonderful for the people that have to go through this with the transplants. So, I mean, he's, he's doing it for a lot of reasons, but he does it. It's a, it's a labor of love for him and curiosity. And he also, he feels very dedicated to trying to help people because a lot of people, you know, they, with these type of situations, they just don't know who to turn to or what to do. Unfortunately, he's there to try to help. Where was your chip implanted? The implant was in the, it was located in my left wrist area, arm wrist area, uh, almost identical to another, uh, another, uh, sur the 15th surgery Dr. Lear done on Ron Noel. His implant was the same shape as mine, a cantaloupe C type object, and located in uh, basically the left wrist area. In fact, uh, we kind of wonder if we could almost put the x-rays over each other and they'd almost be in the same spot. Did it hurt after the surgery? Yeah, when they got a hold of the object, it felt, you know, I felt it a lot of pressure and uncomfortable with my arm. Like it was, you know, got chicken winged and I kind of had to carry it in a sling for a little while, but then it, it calmed down. It really, you know, like I said, it was just, uh, like it was just being, uh, the arm was being abused. I realized this thing was hooked to my nervous system because when I became aware of it, you know, it was like it was aware of me and I was aware of it. The link between the implants and the abductees.